forever. Dog. Hi, welcome to NPR. This is Mary Houlihan, and I'm speaking with artist Norman Chernick Zeitlin. Hi. Norman, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Splendid. So tell me about your new book. My new book is um, Where the Wild Things Are, a new version by Norman Chernick Zeitlin. I'm all into being inauthentic and mm. finding like um, copies of things that I make my own, even if they're famous. And so I'm just copying the where the wild things are and making it my own. It's really original. I love it. I love it when, as a fan of artists, I love it when artists take something and make it their own. Yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> I know. It's, it's in, it's, it was really the revolution in the 80s when people started doing that. And now we just now, all do that all the time, right? It's so <laughs> amazing when you think about it. Hi again, you are listening to NPR. Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> Norman, thank you for coming to my podcast. Mary. <laughs> We're old friends. We're old friends. Um, so I don't think I told you anything about the podcast. In fact, when you got here, you said, are we going to talk about sex stuff? Because I have some stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, you told me you had a sex podcast before. Sure. Well, so the thing about this podcast is that I think it's very um, hard to describe and market, which is probably a bad idea, but that's OK. <laughs> so it's like. So I have this podcast, Mary Houlihan's Lil Podcast, and then that is like an umbrella under which there are um, like mini series. So me and Sam did episodes where we're sex freaks. Oh, yeah. And so you are a guest on my Distinguished Artist series. Perfect. So I think I think um, none of none of the distinguished artist eps have been released yet but i'm thinking maybe they'll have like a like a classical music <laughs> like maybe something like that okay, that's cute. Yeah, yeah set the mood that's really cute. thank you um so we are longtime friends mm -hmm. we met in sex in freaks sex freaks <laughs> 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 we met in art school mm -hmm. um tell me the freak about yourself and then i'll ask you questions um so we met in art school yeah. i remember when i met you you had long straight brownish red hair mm -hmm. i was stunning you're stunning <laughs> and we met be and we became friends because you were from new jersey and i was from new york mm -hmm. and we both were felt like oddballs in this yeah. strange san francisco setting we thought everyone sucked yeah. and was dumb <laughs> was dumb and if only everyone was down to earth and smart like oh, yeah. us <laughs> they were quick and like critical and wasn't afraid of each other like, yeah. being mean <laughs> yeah everyone's so fake everyone thinks they're being nice but actually being fake polite that's not nice that's actually rude <laughs> yeah so that. we would have rants like that yeah. and dance and dance yeah. <laughs> i spent a lot of that time like looking for guys online yeah on <laughs> man mostly hunt. what i did yeah. manhunt.net on manhunt, my first year of art school <laughs> yeah so tell the listeners about manhunt who might not know about manhunt, manhunt was before grinder before yeah rest in peace i mm -hmm. think i don't know mm. I haven't checked, but before Grindr, it was an online uh, dating sex website for gay men. And um, you made a profile and then you would find other men who liked you on that and they would contact each other. And yeah, it was called Manhunt, a great name. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time on it. In yeah. My freshman year of college in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Met a lot of great guys. Really? Yeah, I did. I learned a lot. Of, I met like different um people from different cultures and communities and places. And I was really interested in that. Are was, there any um, hookups from then that you still keep in any kind of contact with? No, no, I, I could have, but I don't know. Yeah. It was mostly that like we would have these flings and then like learn about each other and then I'd move on to somebody else. Cause I didn't, you know, I wasn't like, didn't find someone that I really, was so for sure. into, but I made friends for a little while and then you move on. I wrote a lot so about it at true. the time too. Like I did it, I used it in my artwork a lot. Really? Yeah, I used to make pieces with it. 
So you're a painter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You use oil paint. For the most part. I use all different things. You do all different kinds of things. What kind of stuff are you making right now? Right now, um, I just finished like this series of paintings that were, they're mixed media pieces that um, are like with foam and paint on top. So they're three-dimensional and layered and uh, they're based off of um, designs from a season of Prada and uh there it's a pretty ge- geometric like um season of patterns and so i thought and they're very 70s looking and i was like oh it'd be cool if i made like abstract geometric paintings out of them like kind of conflating like consumerism and then like the history of abstract painting and um also i but then also finding like uh like body parts in the designs and they're like kind of subtly there in the abstraction so it'll be it'll look like an abstract painting but it's also like a knee that's like maybe bleeding or something like that Mm -hmm. and um and i find those in the designs and then uh i make them into all they're all the same size 12 by um uh, 16 and um and yeah and they can fit into a purse a prada bag Mm-hmm. And then I made a bunch of Prada bags that are bootleg copies of the ones from the same season, but out of um, uh, PVC, which is a, a plastic like material. For sure. And uh, that's transparent. And some of them are painted on the inside, the colors of the bags. And so they're kind of like three dimensional paintings and they're all like, like falling apart. And then um, the other ones are just transparent and there's a painting in the bag mm. that goes inside. And yeah, that's also from the product collection. Do you have pictures of the purses on your Insta? No, I don't. You should. I should put them up. Yeah. I was looking the other day. Oh, I I'll didn't put find some. them. I no, didn't I didn't put them. them. I should put them. Maybe. You need to put them on there and then your Insta will blow up. <laughs> and um, Jeff Bezos and elon musk are gonna be um just chilling on insta and then they'll be like what's this and then they'll give you a zillion dollars i wish Mm -hmm. i wish no i think that um one of the reasons i don't put that stuff right on instagram is because um i don't know i like the idea of having a show with them and then people being surprised because they never seen Mm -hmm. them before Mm -hmm. and if i put them on instagram then they'll be like oh we know really <laughs> I don't, that's like my uh, impression because sometimes when i go to shows i like have seen the work already because of instagram mm-hmm. and so i'm like oh yeah i know i know and i'm looking for the thing that's a surprise yeah. that i haven't seen before yeah so that's one of the reasons i don't do that mm-hmm. but i should i also made fountains actually for to say like the bag some of the bags i made into uh fountains of color so like in them it's like a pump and it's pumping out the color of of um, one part of the bag and then there's different and it's divided into different colors liquid colored liquid because the bags are like stripes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and also one of the reasons the 70s was important like i thought I, they look like 70s prints like there's something very 70s in the style of the the colors and the shapes and everything in the paintings and the because the clothing was inspired from the 70s but uh, in the 70s, the, a lot of fashion designers were copying paintings. So like Yves Saint Laurent did this Mondrian painting uh, a dress. And there is a bunch of other examples with like uh, Christian Lacroix and Versace. And uh, so there was also this like kind of return to that, but from the opposite direction, like taking fashion mm-hmm. and turning it into paintings instead. You should make a Banksy dress. How badass <laughs> would that be? <laughs> if only I liked Banksy more. <laughs> I want to do um, it more. What are your thoughts on Banksy? <laughs> I don't know. It's, I kind of find Banksy a little bit boring. Yeah. It doesn't make me think. I feel think. bad. I always think they're obvious, the things yes. he puts. And I'm like, oh. I like artwork that makes me think about something else. Yeah. My friend JP McDade, he's a comedian, and he has a joke about Banksy mm-hmm. where he does like an impression of Banksy. <laughs> and I forget exactly how it goes, but it's or something. It's like this or something. <laughs> No, it's like he starts by saying, like, I hate that people like him is so, like, not deep and obvious and stuff that, like, any 10-year-old would say and does say. And so then he goes into the impression that's like, um, so it's Mickey Mouse, but (laughs) 
but he has a gun. <laughs> <laughs> so it like represents how like capitalism is like bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one over here is, uh, it's like a rat, and it's like holding money. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> shows that like money's bad. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's all I feel obvious bad to mm, I feel like criticizing stuff that's like earnest and means well. Uh I feel guilty doing like it. Like Banksy? Yeah, kind of. It's so earnest and means well. I don't know. I guess well, you I don't know. It became pretty commercial pretty fast. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Whatever. Why not criticize it? It's yeah. up in the public eye. You can criticize whatever you want. You're in the public right. Eye. That's what it's there for. Also, like, he's so famous and got yeah. so much attention. Like, your criticism isn't hurting like, banks. You're right. Like, it's he's not like he's crying. vulnerable. He's not in a vulnerable he listens position. To this, and then he's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a fan of her and she doesn't like me. <laughs> Why'd you bring up Banksy? Um,. Why did I bring up Banksy? Oh, because you were talking about making um, fashion out of paintings. Oh, and then I thought it would be funny <laughs> to make Jacob Banksy, Banksy dress. I bet that was done definitely oh, in LA, for in LA sure. like, when he got big. They always do that kind of stuff there. Have you seen um, the Comedy Central show Corporate? No. They have a great episode that makes fun of Banksy. And it's, Not really. it's about like that, like... Um, anti-consumerism becoming uh what do you call a commodity mm -hmm. in and of itself so there's like a fake banksy character who makes these awesome paintings and then they like get sold uh like people charge admission to like look at the wall that it's on mm -hmm. and then this banksy guy gets like hired as a consultant and like works at a corporation and mm -hmm. um you know it's shows that he clearly cares about fame and money and uh, that everything is bad and oh. it's done in a funny way i like it i don't know if it's so bad to care about fame and money though. right i'm not so um well, moralistic cause you're very way. famous and rich <laughs> <laughs> no because i mean i think the i don't think people's desires are bad i just think mm. people uh how those desires were created could be Something that's bad mm -hmm. but um yeah i don't know norman what do you think about the art market what do you think about the system that artists must exist in i mean it's pretty um hard and difficult and uh it, it's just like the rest of the market mm -hmm. exploits people and uh makes only a few people really rich and successful and and um and they exploit lots of other workers who aren't artists who are just like make to make their stuff but that's the whole entire system it's not like i don't think the art market's separate from like the rest of the marketplace it's just mm -hmm. another part of it it's well, all bad the marketplace <laughs> it's all unregulated it's all like hurting people it's all making people poor and starve yeah and we don't have to live that way <laughs> the art market's just like another extension of that yeah. Whenever I tell people who um, who aren't artists, when I tell them about like artist assistance, mm -hmm. um, they're just like, "What?" And then, really, like but the, the whole history of art has artists. I mean, the entire yeah. art history has artist assistance. Regular like, people don't know that though. Down to Neolithic art, yeah, but yeah. everyone like those famous painters in like the 1600s couldn't make those huge mm -hmm. enormous paintings without like all the people that made i mean it's just too right. hard for one person i guess now i mean it's probably similar but now what do they get so upset about because they think if a uh, if a work is said to be made by so and so they think it should be done by so and so oh but it is it's their idea and like their creative direction right. it's like a movie that's true I mean, in the art world, the one thing that is really messed up is they don't give credit to everybody who made it. Like, they don't yeah. say, like, and assisted by blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And, like, this person did this. Like, in the, in the film industry, they have that. And the art world, for some reason, that never crossed over. I, don't, I have no idea why. I think yeah. it has to do with something about the 
like um, I think it makes it sound less valuable. Exactly. Yeah. And there's something about the genius of the artist yeah. and like the touch <laughs> so and like stupid. there's their mark and their brand and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, with a move, but but still, directors dominate the movie Are industry. There, like, like everyone's like, oh, this director did this, and like it's called their movie, even though we all know who else worked on it. So it could be like that in the art world. It could translate. So people in the art world, are there any unions? Because like I don't know, the film movement, world yeah. there's, is very unionized. And so you would imagine that like if it weren't, you could just be like, it's directed <laughs> by Woody Allen, the end. Mm-hmm. And like not have credits that say everyone that worked on it. Yeah, well, there was a movement to do that, Mm -hmm. Um, but they never really took off because so many artists don't want to be art handlers, for example, forever. They like have the, everyone has so much ambition and Mm -hmm. ego. You're kind of, I think people don't want to stick to be in a union. You really have to like plan on sticking around in that field for a while to unionize. You know, people have to really work hard and, and for a long time to organize and get everyone to create this union. And then like, unions work the best when people are staying in those jobs for a long time because they build up um seniority and like that whole stuff and they get all these benefits and the reason for them is that like they can stay they'll stay for a long time so like um and so like at galleries there's art handlers but i they come and go a lot like there's probably some people that stay for a long time but often they move on so that's been the main problem i think with unionizing in that way and then for artists in general it's extremely hard because um how do you unionize people who work for themselves like they can't go on strike they, they there has been these artist strikes but they haven't been very effective because mm-hmm. it's just too large of a world and there's always people who will still make stuff and if all the artists stop making art like who really would get so upset about it other than like the <laughs> some a few rich people that make yeah. stuff i don't know and, our investments oh yeah. no and, yeah exactly yeah maybe their investments would probably get even more expensive if everyone That's stopped true. making art so um they would go up in value um so yeah but when at but there are places where there are unions of like art handlers which is where a lot of artists work in like at sotheby's and christie's and mm. stuff but the corporations there have been trying to break it for a very long time so and awful. they almost did yeah well that's how corporations work they always try to break unions they don't want people to be able to organize and get more money from the people on top yeah but at but Sotheby's corporations I, are people yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all their little cells yay we're their hair follicles mm-hmm. <laughs> you know it's freaked up it's mm-hmm. kind of like an obvious point but i only heard it for the first time recently about like the whole conversation about um, like the legality of corporations being quote unquote people is like the idea that you can put a person in prison for life and you can't put a corporation in prison for life as like. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's just no. Yeah. Clearly corporations are people. Well, I mean, I guess, like, the legal thing is, like, well, they have to, like, pay out when they get sued. So, you know, whatever. Um, They're saying that, like, they have some sort of accountability by having to pay fines or being able to get sued. But um, But so do all institutions. mm -hmm. And the government, too. Sure. So, no, the, the corporate personhood thing had to it was like had to do with like um i can't remember now but there was i don't think it it was just it was it was criticized by everybody even people Mm -hmm. on the right because it's so obvious yeah like ridiculous it was a way for i just met this guy who like wrote like the book on it i should try to get him on this pod he was so interesting (laughs) god what is his name in um I actually worked on something with unionization and because I worked at Sotheby's as an art handler and uh, and I was fired from there because I made this art piece that was about unionization during their like um, art, their employee art show. And um, I gave a talk about it at uh, Eflux in our organization a few years, uh, four or five years ago. Wait, you did this? Yeah. What? Okay, yeah, did you didn't know about that? No, what the freak. Oh, and um, 
let's see, what year was it? I don't know, it was like four or five years ago. I uh, was working at Sotheby's and then during their employee art show, I did like a carnival for uh, unionization that was called Insemination Carnival because mm-hmm. I had because our symbol was the horse of our union. The art handlers union was like part of um, the, uh, what do you call it, union? The, um, the Teamsters union, which symbol is the horse. And um, so I got this huge like, horse inseminator like one of these tools they use to like oh my God. inseminate horses <laughs> and um to make them pregnant and uh and so I, got, and I took some photos of that and i made posters with that and then i got all these horse balloons like the same number as there are art handlers at sotheby's uh-huh. and i blew them up and i had the, like a huge amount of them in the exhibition space and then i had this carnival song playing this union song called um union made that's an old union song uh-huh. and i turned it into a carnival song without the words. So it was just like, I was like that wow. but for the union song. And, uh, and it was playing throughout the halls and nobody realized for a while. And then eventually they caught on, like the management caught on. And then at the right, the day after the end of the show, they fired me. <laughs> what did they say? They just took me to the office and they didn't have to give a reason. Uh-huh. Cause I wasn't in the union yet. I was about to make the mm-hmm. point where I could apply. Yeah 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 and the art handlers also kind of uncomfortable with it some of them because i made it so much of, like i kind of sexualized the whole thing with yeah. this horse inseminator <laughs> and like and there's a popped balloon poster also like a popped horse balloon and i kind of explained it to them in this like uh like erotic metaphorical way and uh and that <laughs> and also because they're, like, they're very okay, macho like uh, cool. yeah, the whole union guys were very yeah. macho they were, and i was just like gay boy yeah. working there so i always kind of fell out of it also right from that and you're uh, talking to them about horse cum <laughs> yeah and they thought it was funny but they're always really yeah. uncomfortable with that and uh yeah and so it was a mixed thing anyway but then after that i i gave a talk about it at sotheby's in relationship to um and not sotheby's at um eflux in relation to like this artist who does a lot of work about what goes on behind the scenes in the mm. art world and like how distorted it is and like how messed up the value system is and she made like a a fictive uh artist who was having a solo show and he was having like a lot of problems figuring out what to do because of all the he was a mid-career artist and like had needed to keep it going and like had to rush to do it and so he fabric he had all these people make his pieces for him in a fabrication workshop this is different than having assistance Mm -hmm. a lot of famous artists all over the world but especially like the big time ones and like middle level ones have their work made for them in these huge like these factories basically in germany and switzerland i'm sure there's some in america too but i just know about the ones there and those factories like they basically just send them a design and will have some interaction with them but they're they're people they don't even know who just make their sculptures for them for example and they do make a lot of their own the decisions for it too because they make minute decisions in the process of making them so this artist natasha sader hagegian she did a piece with this guy named um uva schwarza i think his name was and um they who runs one who's a manager or a director of one of these factories and they did a project together where about the this like um process of making artworks for artists like for them yeah Mm. and um this kind of alienated process and uh yeah and so she did this show and made these horse jumps and artists love horses yeah artists (laughs) yeah so it had this relationship to my horse thing with the insemination carnival and um and these horse jumps were because were taken from the scene in My Fair Lady where everyone's at the horse races, all the bourgeois people mm. are all dressed up and they're there to see and be seen. And then the horses would race by really fast and they would all put their binoculars up for one moment and look and then take them down and continue their conversations. And they weren't obviously watching the horses at all. It was just like all for show. And uh, the binoculars were even for no reason because the horses were very close. And um, And so she was taking that like scene and using it as like a a metaphor for like the art world and how like people make all this work and it's no one cares about the work it's about like the social scene and about the value and about all these signs that are um that are opaque to just like the social value hierarchy and so anyway so she built all these her and this guy uva schwarzer made all these horse jumps so there's a horse jump there 
and then I did a talk about my piece, mm. and there were some a few other talks from like um, yeah, from some interesting people. It was a really nice show. Okay, yeah. is this a dumb question? Um, would you want to be like one of those mega rich artists? I think if I was, I wouldn't have my work made for me mm -hmm. in that way. I think it's fun to make my own work. I think that's one of the reasons I like making right. art. But that just my, I don't judge the artists who do that because I mm -hmm. understand. I I'm really not into like. Uh, judging them for their process i think that like the system demands that of them and like also i don't think that like it has to be like their hand in the work to like make the work authentic i think having other people make it is is fine it's actually right. part of it's actually if anything conceptually just becomes part of the work um i think it, it's spooky though that mm, it seems like when you get to that level your audience becomes like a very exclusive yeah well the odd yeah your audience kind of either it's, it's huge like only, and like it's museum wide or it like kind yeah. of sucks and you just have a bunch of like rich people looking at your work and, and other artists though. but you always kind of have this the art community if hopefully looking at your work and artists your friends with engaging with it hopefully and that kind of keeps you going i guess yeah yeah no the most beautiful art is one that's still connected to yeah. a community or something. Yeah, that normal yeah, freaking that's people part of a culture. can look at. Yeah, it's actually part of a culture. Yeah. I have an aside. The book and person I was thinking of is Adam Winkler, the writer of We the Corporations, How American Businesses Won Their Civil Rights. Which basically, <laughs> they used like the civil rights that's movement so as a playbook, like copied all of like the legal mechanisms of getting... Uh, rights for women and minorities and then like use that as arguments for yeah for really for corp for corporations having mm -hmm, more like mm -hmm. protections and yeah getting away with more criminal yep. stuff mm -hmm. it's, and, and screwing it's, over their workers <laughs> yeah it's so and, and their consumers mm -hmm. uh, it's terrible i know i just heard my dad was just telling me the other day about um how the trump administration got rid of this uh law that forced uh, a regulation that said that investment uh banks um and other kind of investment firms mm -hmm. had to um put their uh the their clients interests first which seems obvious to me that that would be mm -hmm. that that's what they would do and they got rid of the trump administration got rid of that law oh. that regulation so now what and yes and it hurts workers and middle class people the most because all of all most people That's have like four hundred one k s. Their with. retirement yeah. funds are all in these investment banks and stuff. And they, um, though now the firms will put their interests first, like how much money they can make first before their clients. Mm -hmm. So that means people were going to lose a lot of money in their um, retirement funds. It, it, their interests aren't going to come, and rich people can avoid this because they'll just go to investment banks that will put their interests first because mm -hmm. they're much more knowledgeable and careful and watching with their right. investments. While people, all workers and middle class people, don't totally follow all this stuff and they're not right. like inspecting their four hundred one ks and how that stuff works. Anyway, it's just kind of a, a real disaster for um, retirement plans of middle class and working class people. Yeah, it's really stupid, and of course, just another way that the corporations are. Um, screwing us. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I feel like when we were in art school, I would get really um, pissed off and shitty about this. And like every single like critical essay I had to write was about like how the art world audience is just like super duper 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 rich mostly white people um and that there's like an exclusivity that you're not really allowed to enjoy this work unless you have a certain education um and so every single essay i would write would say like well if you look at Chappelle's show like just talking mm -hmm. about any sort of tv show or movie that uh addressed societal issues in an entertaining way and like reached a mass how that seems more effective and culturally important and that uh, i hate art <laughs> 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 and 
And I feel like that's how I got mm, veered into comedy mm-hmm. world, I guess. So I was like, no one's going to look at anything I make. And what's the point in like saying anything deep if like, yeah, if it's just truly like an investment product for rich people to buy. But not, but you don't, not everyone has to become an artist like that, I think. Yeah. And also, even if it's an investment product that people, rich people buy, people still see it. And also not all artwork is necessarily, I think, has to be so much about, like, um, so, like, so visible, like an artwork can also just be, um, uh, like, a, uh, an experiment that you do uh, for yourself and your own, like, um, inter- and, like, relationship to the world. And then if that gets picked up by, like, society and history and stuff mm-hmm. that's what happens but also arc- I, I, it's hard to focus so much when you make artwork on uh, what the outcome will be in terms of um, uh, like function mm-hmm. because then you get so caught up in that that you don't end up making the things you want to make I think Right. Like, and a lot of the stuff that I want to make is I've discovered, I've recently thought about now is more um, like kind of an expression and interpretation and like, uh, like thinking of it in terms of poetry, like maybe like someone will be touched by this Mm. and like interact with it. And that's like, that's good enough and great. And, um, and making like change to political change is not really like my goal right. with artwork at all. Like I think that's more something you mm-hmm. could do if you want to organize. Like that, where that f- works the best is organizing people, and that's where that happens. Right, organizing people is where that change is made, and like, yeah. And so, and you can do both, mm-hmm. but I just painting is not the place. Painting doesn't organize people. I think painting is painting it's working with like um it's like a piece of yeah it's the working whole. with a, a square that's blank and then how do you solve that and resolve it it's like a lot more related to like pure math i think and mm. even if it does have and then in the end if it does have like you wanted to have some uh elements that are like culturally significant in terms of politics or meaning yeah that's great and interesting for the people that see it but it's not going to be what like mm-hmm. is like a, a perf- like a, a show a performative show which does something totally different or sure because it is much more social something my priest said that i liked was um i guess like in reference to wanting to change the world wanting the world to be better um and feeling like Oh, I'm shitty because I'm not doing this enough. Um, I'm not using my time the most effectively because I need to organize and give money and give time and give all this. And I'm not giving enough and I want to give everything and I don't want to pick one area to focus in. To make it your job. Um. So he sort of said to think of it as like, no, you have like a role. Just pick one role in like the movement. And if you are like a naturally, naturally drawn to the arts or performing or whatever, then that is your role. You're um, a person, like you said, that, like personally affects the viewer or encourages them when they're feeling weak or you are a spokesperson telling people where to donate. Um, This is like a funny example because everyone thinks he's douchey, but I feel like that's uh, like the way that Bono (laughs) operates in the world, right? Yeah. 
It's like, well, if I'm going to be super duper famous, I guess <laughs> even if it like comes off as annoying, I'll like only talk about problems in the world and what it people can people do about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know much about Bono. I never followed him or like what he does. And I'm, I hope he does really like good stuff. Mm. Um, but I mean, it's, I think that having one role is a, is a, makes things manageable and stuff. Right. And also, um, uh, if, yeah, I think you have to kind of, if you really want to be effective, you have to kind of make it, you talked about like all these different things, like give money, time, all this stuff. You have to just make it your job. If you really, that's what mm-hmm. you want to, your life, that's like your raison d'etre mm-hmm. of your life. Like you should um, just make it your job. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. What do you think about um, uh like being an artist and having a job how does that work for you and how maybe would you prefer for it to work or etc if uh it, it works pretty well for me right now like i teach what do you teach i teach hebrew Woo! <laughs> and torah nice because um i know that stuff pretty well so mm-hmm. and i don't need it doesn't take very much for me to uh like remember it but um yeah it i like it when my job can influ- and can become part of my um art practice like it has in the past like it usually collides and i it becomes like a an element of what I how I make something uh but uh right now this the Hebrew school stuff hasn't been doing that right and I'm a little frustrated with that and so I'm thinking about maybe changing jobs because I don't it hasn't come together for me there hasn't been something that uh has meshed but maybe I'm gonna do it next year maybe will um but who knows but yeah that's how i think mm. for Would me at least it works i don't know other people just have a job and then they make work that's entirely right. separate from that because they, they do it to make money and then they're not so reliant on on making sellable work but then mm-hmm. there's artists who i know who only s- make work that is sellable and have these great shows and make money off of it but they and their artwork becomes their entire business and uh that seems great to me too i'd like to do that all i'd like to have that Mm -hmm. um i sometimes think that the teaching hebrew school is really distracting yeah and uh would you want to be still an educator but just in a different no 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 way i feel like i could see you being a professor so exhausting you don't think so a professor like of college students maybe i don't know my dad was a professor Mm -hmm. and i saw how um exhausting it is like yeah grading exams and also i have friends who are professors and they're all like a drain and of art like what i would probably teach maybe i could teach something else but it seems really exhausting and i teach kids like i teach fifth and sixth and fourth graders and it's those days that i teach are just i can't do anything else it's really draining and because you have to give so much to them and you're managing them and at the same time trying to get them to understand something that they're experiencing for the first time and mm. and uh i teach them new language or like right. concepts from the bible like and religion which are difficult to teach to kids because they don't really care yeah and it sounds um, like you need to be very mentally and emotionally available and on yeah, in addition very on, to yeah. all the other work yeah it should be very on yeah i yeah when when i was learning this stuff when i was younger um like torah and stuff like that i learned it completely differently than way, the way these kids do i learned it in this like very orthodox kind of way and uh it was very like on the on the table like you read the text and you tra- everyone goes around you like translate the text and interpret it and the teacher tells you if your reading of it was wrong or right and then you had to listen to everyone else's and then you have these exams and tests and it was just very um, like rigid and like uh, but also very collective and like everyone had to focus at the same time it was 
much more focused and the way I teach at the Hebrew school I teach at is very much like hodgepodge different things together at the same time that kids can't read the text of the Torah so you don't really give that to them and even in English it's like over their heads and they context you have to give them so much context and mm. and everything like that and even then it's just like this ephemeral thing to them that is kind of not in place all the time and and how it relates to like uh, their life is unclear even if you try to figure that out and give them something that's still really difficult I think to translate but yeah so that's how teaching gets really exhausting mm -hmm. anyway but yeah being a professor I think is is pretty draining also Dang. of college students but because they're mm. so dumb <laughs> no I think because you also had to give so much to them and try to make right. them learn yeah and uh yeah oh I I went to San Francisco did I tell you no listener I just went when? on a big month-long uh, house sitting stay in California. So I was in Los Angeles, but I went to San Francisco mm. for a weekend while I was there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I went to SFAI, mm -hmm. our alma mater. Oh, I saw Caitlin Mitchell Dayton, our painting professor. Did you mm. have her? No. Oh, but I you know knew her. her. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Who was your favorite teacher at SFAI? A favorite teacher? Yeah. I mean, obviously brett reichman but um, tell our dear listener about brett reichman brett reichman is my dear friend he is our professor at sfi he's a painter he's so good and um he would run his class like it was uh, <laughs> like america's top, next top model, model. Yeah. and uh, <laughs> he was very judgmental and intense yeah and uh you were going to like a judge's panel <laughs> yeah <laughs> And he loves Pack your bags the way and light. Go home. <laughs> <laughs> he loves the way light falls on objects. And um, yeah, he was uh, he was really funny too. Yeah, he was a great sense of humor. And yeah, I see he was our painting professor, and I'm still friends with him. He's a nice guy. Um, but yeah, and uh, I also like this other teacher um, uh, named. Uh, I like Krista Lines. Oh, yeah. She was an art history teacher. She was great. I feel like you're going to uh, become a professor Dale whether Carico. you like it or not. No. It's going to happen. How could I? I haven't gotten an MFA. I'm like so out of the academic world. Yeah. I Sometimes I think about it. I was like, Don't oh, I like should like go and get a history PhD. <laughs> to be a college professor? No, you like, do. I feel like at art it's schools, so there's like workarounds for people no, no? It's so competitive mm. oh my god not for you look though. at tom he had to go all the way to alaska to get a job and he like went to yale and like blah 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 and, and now it's really starving. hard to get a art no he's not he's doing he's so on good on the street oh, yeah yeah right <laughs> he's doing so well really yeah he's saying like, i don't keep up with him really oh no he's like gonna be like a like a whatever you call it tenured professor damn yeah that's, that's good. cool um yeah, it takes a, a lot to get a professorship in fine arts. Really competitive. It's cutthroat. I don't yeah. know. I don't think I'd do well in that. If you're just tuning in, this is NPR. Um, this is Mary Hulhan speaking with Norman Chernick Zeitlin about his art and consumerism and <laughs> <laughs> corporate power. Um, we're we're in the last few minutes of the podcast. I'm trying to strategize what's like the best way to like close it out. Maybe like a lightning round of fun questions. Um, yeah, sure. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, what's your favorite? Okay, name me art or artists that are inspiring you lately and you have to name at least one that's like an artist like art thing and then the other one can be like a pop culture thing um okay let's start with the pop culture thing yeah um the thing that is inspiring me the most right now into the mic sir is um <laughs> i don't know about pop culture if anything and pop culture really? is inspiring me do right now do you still now. watch south park yeah but <laughs> no i don't know that stuff doesn't inspire me it, it gets in your brain 
yeah, but I've watched that's- it so much. I'm so used to it. You know what I mean? It's like right. something that's just like, I watched it since I was like 11 years old or something. Like mm-hmm. maybe even younger. I don't know. Since it first came out, I remember the first season. <laughs> what, like, if it's you like, made, like, <laughs> what if you made paintings of Cartman? Oh, no. What if that was your art? No, oh my God. <laughs> so, yeah. It's like that Colombian artist who does those like, rotund people mm. <laughs> just, i don't know it'd be kind of boring i think um mm, no i don't know pop culture doesn't really inspire me at the moment i really lo- so okay yeah i can think of something i my i think i've really gotten into looking at uh clothing and that's like what mm. i think about a lot recently so i've been looking at um the way people like just dress on the street just like um uh not really rich people or like people that are wearing fancy clothes but really like uh like moms in in like brooklyn like lower class neighborhoods and like when we were just in italy and like how people dress in sicily and like uh but just really like working class people Mm -hmm. and uh what they what they put together the fat materials and stuff and like just look taking photos of that all the time and looking at that and uh combinations i i don't know i've just been looking at that a lot and and making drawings with them and stuff like that i don't know that's what i've been i guess thinking about at the moment and then an artist that i really like oh they're all so, there's so many it's okay oh i know yeah. one uh her name is uh, Bernadette, she's German. I just Peters. learned about her. Yeah, Bernadette Peters. No, I just learned about her. She does these really cool Bernadette. Uh, what's her last name? Uh, she is a German artist, and she did these really cool um, motorcycles that she took apart and like turned in, like kind of took away the center of the motorcycle where the seat is, so they become these like curved, like alien looking oh cool creatures and it's just a motorcycle and also they're leaking the like fluids that because the whole center was taken away i guess that's where the motor is or something Mm. and uh, so like the fluids that would have gone into things there are kind of leaking on the floor and there are these um i saw it in um i was just in dusseldorf visiting my friend ava and uh yeah and that was that was a really cool show let me see. What is it? Just Googling Bernadette's yeah. last name. Yeah. What's it gonna be? Kunstpalast. Yeah. It was a relief from like everything in Germany, this show. Yeah. Um, I love it. Norman. Mm-hmm. And also the reason, one of the reasons I liked it because I dealt with like um, products like clothing huh? right. like clothing a lot and turning and like kind of uh undoing them making them into something else and uh you know having that be like uh, a kind of interpretation of um of that of that object the world it, it mm-hmm. like that's kind of how i like to think about uh making things these days norman yeah Thank you for joining me on my Distinguished Artist series. Oh, wait, you don't want me to tell you about this artist? <sighs> we don't have time, Normie. Oh, okay, it's done. Um, so if I was some freaking rando out there, mm-hmm. how would I uh, learn more about you or see stuff that you make? Um, you can look at me on my um, my Instagram. It's um, Norman's, uh, what is it? Norman CZ. On Instagram, yeah. At Norman C Z Z. On Instagram. Cool. And then I have a website, Norman I love it. Yeah. I love you. Love you too, Mary. See you soon. Thanks for having me on. Forever <laughs> Dog. This has been a Forever Dog production. Executive produced by Dog. Brett Boehm. Joe Cilio, and Alex Ramsey. For more original podcasts, please visit foreverdogpodcasts.com and subscribe to our shows on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Keep up with the latest Forever Dog news by following us on Twitter and Instagram 
at Forever Dog Team and like.